Good evening. My name is Kevin Cass. I think most of you already know me. Um, I'm with Development Services here at the city. Work with Heritage Crossing along with Doug Janeway and others, Jonathan Bazan. And we welcome you here tonight. This is our third uh, large-scale meeting, as we would say. We had one back in January, which was our initial kickoff meeting down at uh, Glory House on Main Street. Then in early February, we had the, um, the workshop out here. Hopefully some of you were able to attend that as well. Tonight's our third meeting, and the purpose of tonight's meeting is to lay out what we call our final draft recommendations. We've hired uh, the firm Gateway Planning. Uh, they have expertise in small town, downtown redevelopment in the area here and across the region. And if you've been to any of their previous presentations, I think you've been pleased with what you've heard thus far. We have. They bring a very refreshing new look at things and things we've maybe overlooked or been misdirected on our own in the past. So tonight, I want to keep, I want to have you keep in mind that we brought them on board for 60 days to give us an overall high-level view of what we think we need to do or what needs to be done to help jumpstart development. We also asked them in that time to help us with an RFP, a request for proposals for some single family and townhome development along Delaware Creek. And that's a proposal we'll be hopefully be letting out here with before the end of the month. Uh, tonight's presentation will cover some material that you might have already seen, but there is new material. We will touch a little bit tonight on commercial development, but as Scott will tell us, some of that's a few years off. Uh, but he will give us some groundwork on how we should address those. And also, I just wanted to recognize, I see one council member in our audience tonight, Michael Galloway, place one back there. Thank you for coming this evening. And um, if, you have not on the, if you have not picked one up, we'll hand you one. You can pick one up, one of the PowerPoint copies for tonight. And there's also a sign-up sheet in back. I don't need you to sign up if you've already signed up, because we have a nice, great database that we email stuff out to people on. But if you've not signed up with us before, we'd ask you to do that, and I'll have you in our database. So with that, I'm ready to turn it over to Scott. What we will have afterwards is a discussion, question, and answer session. I have a separate microphone here. I'll go around and hand it to everyone. And we are recording this, but it's a tape delay. My understanding is it'll be available tomorrow. And then we will also, once I get my copy of it, I'll load this on the Heritage Crossing webpage which many of you said you've been using already with a hyperlink where you just click on it and it takes you right to that web page. You can only look at tonight's presentation, but also the past presentations that we've done as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Scott Polakov, Gateway Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, Tommy. Um, it's good to be back. I've gotten to know many of you, and um, uh, I certainly don't mind if you, maybe we should wait till the end. I don't have that many slides. I was going to say to be interrupted, but because we need it on microphone, we'll just, well, you've got to, okay. Um, as Kevin said, what we're trying to do tonight is to um, set a framework going forward uh, for some near-term catalytic activities, but really to uh, fundamentally, I think, for a generation, set the framework for Heritage Crossing. So I would say that a lot of what you're going to see actually reflects much of what you've said to us, uh, and also, I think, what just good common sense suggests. And uh, additionally, I think, fundamentally, just some of our observations of what the priority should be now in order to really uh, take advantage of coming out of the a recession into the next development cycle, but doing it in a way that creates opportunities that are um, really accessible. I think that's the key. I know that's been one of the most important things that we've heard is that you all want this to be uh, a, a context where the uh, opportunities are accessible to small business people, to small landowners, to small investors, and uh, the key is that you don't have to necessarily be a big player to come into an environment that really needs uh, a lot of very careful consideration. The details matter block by block, building by bl building, storefront by storefront. And so hopefully what we've set out tonight, based on a lot of what we've heard you say, but also just based on some of our own experience, 
will set that framework. Um, I'm essentially going to go through eight or nine key areas and set, really this is a policy document. You know, in 60 days or so, you can only do so much, although we did render up what we believe are some good uh, starting points for an aggressive uh, reinvention of Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street and connecting Main Street uh, over to the, to the uh, uh, TOD area, the train station area. Uh, most of you in this room have participated in many of these activities, whether they were informal meetings or formal meetings or discussions. Uh, we've done a lot of community engagement. Uh, that was probably half of the work we've done or more. And um, frankly, if this doesn't work for you, it's not going to work. So you're the, you're the consumers of this work. Kevin and I talked when I prepared this draft for, for his review to make sure we were on the same page. Um, this, this is our conclusion in terms of what's the role of the city in redevelopment going forward. Um, with your participation, it's, it's the role of government is to set the vision. Um, uh, to get the zoning infrastructure and housing policy correct, uh, I think the, you'll see some recommendations on zoning and infrastructure. The housing policy is, I think, reflected very strongly in the philosophy and the details of the request for proposal that has now been uh, made available so that uh, we can test the market and get some really good uh, transitional urban living between the core downtown area and the broader heritage crossing neighborhoods. Um, when I say housing policy, I want to stress, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit, that is attracting the broadest market possible so that Heritage Crossing is uh, a place where, regardless of your station in life, and many of you have said, okay, I want to move down here, but I don't have something that I can move into yet. Uh, whether you're a young family, young professional, uh, empty nester, retiree, to take advantage of the senior center, for example. Um, or to start a business and to want to be actually close to where your business is located, which is hard in most communities today to actually be in the same neighborhood that you have a business. Um, uh, I, I don't think there's any question that once government sets the framework based on the community's interest and what the market uh, ultimately thinks makes sense, is then government needs to get out of the way. Um, I, I do think that that's part of the problem with a lot of planning in the United States is that there's a prejudging of what people think should be there. And I promise you, we've heard a hundred different things for what should be in downtown in the broader heritage crossing area. And probably 95 out of those hundred make sense. You know, every once in a while you hear something and you just have to kind of go, well, mm, I don't know. Uh, but there's already a lot of stuff and a lot of great businesses down here. Um, uh, when I come here, I always try and either eat, I got my hair cut today, I look like a hippie. Uh, and so I know uh, two barbers now down here, but you have a lot of great businesses. Um, and then uh, I think what's already happening, but more importantly, and this will be the bigger challenge going forward, is what is the role of the city in supporting the incubation of businesses? What is the legal and policy limitation in their capacity, in your capacity as a community, to actually make the difference between a business person being able to make the first six months or year or not when there is a market for what they want to do, but they just don't necessarily have the complete resources to do it. Um, I think the request for proposal reflects this. Uh, I think this has been a strong uh, underlying goal uh, from the very beginning, but the diversity of those that have access from an uh, investor builder or developer perspective, I think is critical. Um, uh, and uh, you have the unique opportunity because you have a significant amount of land that is now in public ownership to facilitate that diversity. And the RFP, if you haven't seen it, and I think, uh, is, is Doug here tonight? Hi, hey, Doug. Um, you know, Doug worked as the person responsible for the asset disposition. Uh, Doug has been incredible in terms of being responsive to our recommendations and other community members' recommendations on embedding directly into 
the uh, metrics that will be used to determine best value, uh, things that normally you don't see in RFPs for public land disposition, and that is, for example, the ability of developers and builders to come in and show that they can deliver eclecticism. But that's the only way that you're going to have, I think, a long-term uh, sustainability of the marketplace here is that you're not relying on any one individual, you're not relying on any one project, you're not relying on any one building type or housing type or anything that if it doesn't work then uh, it, then the market doesn't have the opportunity to correct. And uh, these are the uh, renderings that we developed to uh, show, you can see here, uh, the parcels that the city owns, parcels 10 through 12 along Delaware Creek. These are the renderings that we developed as part of the process to demonstrate uh, that you can have a full diversity of housing types uh, and they can be related to one another. Uh, they can create great private spaces and also then relate to the public spaces, for example, the frontages along the creek. And as you can see, there was even a suggestion that we even changed the drawing. The original drawing didn't have any commercial in this particular location, but for example, uh, on 6th here, you can have in the creek, you, can, you could pr have two cool little restaurants uh, that could front uh, on the creek, and because of the configuration in the alley, you could have some, some parking that would not conflict with any of the immediately adjacent existing or future housing. Um, and that's the difference between an urban or downtown area and a suburban area is that you transition through the appropriate de urban design as opposed to putting up buffers and walls and the kinds of things that create separation. Similarly, on the uh, parcel uh, on both the north and south side of uh, 2nd Street next to the Senior Center, the uh, opportunity to have a diversity of housing uh, and then different ways to take advantage of the existing natural assets. Um, there's not a right or wrong answer. I think you can't ignore or not take advantage, but there's different ways to go about it. So these, these renderings show you our attempt to come up with a different mix of housing and different ways of taking advantage of those trees. Again, these drawings actually are uh, included as examples in the request for proposal uh, to give the marketplace some ideas, but not necessarily require that this be the exact way to propose. The bottom line, though, is, is that you can see we're encouraging the kind of the original philosophy of how Irving was developed once upon a time in a modern context. And then similarly, the beginnings of looking at some of the commercial properties or the mixed use properties as you get closer to the core of downtown. That building, by the way, that bank building is in Snyder Plaza in Dallas, and I love that building. It's over by my bike shop, and that's on the corner of, I think, uh, Lovers, and is it Hillcrest, maybe? Snyder. Snyder Plaza. And if you look, take a look at that building, what do you see that's in that building? There's a drive through in that building. I mean, so the point is, is that you can do things in a modern context, but you don't have to necessarily throw away uh, great urbanism and pedestrian orientation. Uh, boldly reinvent Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street. I think this is the near-term opportunity. And uh, well, what I want to show you here tonight is, and, and by the way, Lynn Carpenter is a, uh, a new landscape architect, has uh, helped us and joined our team. And she's a resident of Irving, so we're excited for her to be a part of this. Um, and what I'm going to show you is our attempt to come up with some concepts. Uh, that's all they are. Uh, a lot of work has to be done going forward from a uh, engineering and safety perspective, work with TxDOT, for example, but that's not necessarily going to be a problem because you already have uh, basically an urban condition. Uh, but I really do believe that uh, a substantial sooner than later reinvention of Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street through the heart of Heritage Crossing, at least between uh, uh, the two uh, uh, connection points, east and west, make sense. Uh, to reset, basically, the context from what is still essentially functioning as a commuter environment through your downtown to a, an immediate and visceral 
obvious, apparent reaction when you drive into Heritage Crossing that you have arrived in a place and there is reason to stop and there are people living there and there are businesses there. So, uh, so that you begin to capture and take advantage of the historic pattern that Main Street established. And you see the blue arrow, I'm not quite sure yet, you know, we're early in, in our analysis, but what's going to be the design context that links the rail station eventually to Main Street and to Irving Boulevard? Um, the, the tower, the clock tower, obviously is very important and iconic, and there is that, there is that visual connection, but there's got to be more than that at the street level. Uh, and so we're beginning to explore those. Um, and I think that's really important because, and I just had dinner there at Big State. Um, I added the jalapenos to the patty melt. It was good. <laughs> um, but uh, we don't have to go outside of Heritage Crossing to find what is going to be the long-term uh, DNA of your success. It's already there. But it's isolated at this point. Main Street's isolated. Big State's isolated. The station area, because there's not development yet. And there won't be, candidly, in my s recommended opinion, I think you want to be very careful about pulling the trigger on any development around the station right now, because I think that does deserve some significant intensity. And um, although uh, I think some temporary uses and market type uses and, and incubator type uses uh, and, and, and I know they, they cut both directions in terms of whether they're good or bad, but food trucks are the kinds of things that could bring some vitality between uh, Irving Boulevard and the train station should be considered. So here are two concepts, one for Irving Boulevard and then one for Second Street and the few blocks going each direction for Main Street where we would recommend that you go down to two lanes of traffic um, there's, there's plenty of capacity, um, wider sidewalks, and uh, a very significant intervention at the intersections so that you make it just as easy to walk across the two streets as it is to drive through them. Uh, now, that will slow the traffic down, but the effective speeds right now are highway speeds oftentimes if you get the lights correctly. Um, and so slowing the traffic down substantially I don't think will diminish at all the traffic function. In fact, there's empirical study uh, after empirical study that shows that slower speed traffics tend to be more efficient in terms of moving traffic. So it may take you 30 seconds longer to get through downtown, but when you have more traffic it actually moves uh, larger numbers more safely. The bottom line is it has uncanny impacts on the development potential though when you do that. Uh, for me, the test is very simple and the work we've done uh, here and around the country. And in fact, I just flew in from Albuquerque. We're, if you're familiar with Albuquerque, we, we're on a team. We've just been hired to look at reinventing Central Avenue coming out of downtown towards the uh, hospital and the University of New Mexico, which is the old Route 66. Uh, it's not a bad street, but it still doesn't function well enough, uh, at least in that part of Albuquerque, to encourage people to sit outside in a cafe environment and pay money to eat. And to me, that should be the test. If you're not willing to do that, then the street is not functioning correctly as a destination. Uh, but then when you get outside of the, uh, the immediate area of Main Street, we're suggesting going from 11-foot travel lanes back out to 12-foot or so travel lanes. The sidewalks don't need to be as wide, but I think the uh, pedestrian uh, orientation of the intersections still are absolutely critical. Again, uh, two lanes in each direction. Two, I mean, the two lanes for in each, in, in each of the one-way directions. And then, um, this is very conceptual, but we took a look at how could we actually uh, introduce uh, cycle tracks. Um, there needs to be a lot of, uh, there needs to be a lot of um, um, 
analysis, uh, and F Francesca with Vike Irving uh, and, and, and I and our team and others have been, uh, and with Lynn's help, have been talking about this pretty extensively. There's an emerging bike plan. Uh, Irving is hosting, I don't know if the slide, no, nope, I thought it was in here, but I didn't see it. I thought I had it in here, but there's, uh, in April, uh, uh, there is a, uh, a national event that Irving is hosting uh, on uh, cycling and the role of cycling in, uh, in, in commuting uh, and how to introduce a much better design context so that you have a system of cycling uh, elements throughout the city so that it is easy and convenient to get into the built environment and, into, and onto the trails and back and forth. Um, so as you can see up here, we're talking about potentially, uh, for example, uh, on Irving Boulevard, uh, on the uh, north side, having a cycle track that would be six to seven feet with a two or three foot wide raised separation uh, between the cyclist and the parked car. Uh, the challenge, though, are the curb cuts. Uh, I'm a cyclist. Um, I tend to like to, to ride on uh, streets that don't necessarily have markings, but I would not today ride on Irving Boulevard at all with, in my bike. Um, and, but we think that there needs to be some separation even, even with a reduced width and a more tame traffic environment. But that's just an initial assessment. There's enough right away to do it. There's enough right away to introduce a bike facility into Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street. The question is, is it needed and does it make sense? Because you, ultimately it really is going to be more for permeability going south and arriving, say, to the train station. I don't think you're going to have too many people that are going to necessarily be riding down Irving Boulevard, probably more so on 2nd Street. But in order to access the businesses along Irving Boulevard, for example, if you don't have some sort of bike facility and you want to go down three or four blocks, you're going to have to ride back south, go across a local street east-west, and then come back, or you're going to have to walk your bike. And that doesn't necessarily make sense either. But the challenge with cycle tracks, and what I mean by cycle tracks, is you actually have an area dedicated just for the bike, the, to ride the bike between the sidewalk and the parked car where there's a protected area, is that as you come to intersections, what do you do at the intersections? And uh, if you as a cyclist feel like you're in a protected environment and there's a green light and you ride through, I promise you in an urban condition, most drivers of cars are not expecting you to do that. So do you signalize it separately for the cyclist? How do you handle it? There are a lot of ways to handle it, but these are questions that have to be resolved. So I want to stress that the introduction by us of this concept is to say that it has to be absolutely taken seriously. This is a great opportunity to embrace cycling as a core part of your lifestyle in terms of branding not only the city as a whole, which I know there's been a lot of work to date, but especially the Heritage Crossing area. Um, number one and number two, if we really mean what we say in terms of our conversations we've been having about attracting uh, the young professionals and the 20-somethings and 30-somethings and the, and the business people, um, uh, the outdoor lifestyle in an urban environment is actually very, very important to that market. Incredibly important. Uh, there are cities now that are marketing themselves uh, in many direct ways that they're cycling friendly. Um, and that's becoming a corporate marketing strategy. Uh, in terms of what to do around the rail station itself and the land controlled by the railroad in the triangle and the, the large properties right there at the uh, clock tower. Um, as I said earlier, we just think it's premature uh, in terms of the type of construction, the building type and the type of construction that rents would justify. Um, you have to achieve a, a certain level of rents for residential or rents for your tenants in commercial buildings to justify spending uh, uh, on a per foot basis such that you see in that image. This is a, the train station area that we designed for a future commuter stop on the south side of Ten San Antonio at the new Texas A&M San Antonio campus that we uh, uh, facilitated and gave birth to for our private clients, which we've designed as a very urban area 
uh, in about 1,000 acres. Someday it'll be home to 25 to 30,000 people and a 40 to 50,000 student um, university. Uh, there's already 4,000 students at the new Texas A&M San Antonio campus. So we're designing from scratch essentially a new mini downtown environment. Uh, and we zoned it and designed the infrastructure for uh, th that kind of vertical mixed use development. Um, and that's the train station where you'll be able to get on the train on, at the Texas A&M stop and go up to downtown San Antonio and eventually downtown Austin. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the rents aren't ready for that kind of construction type down there either. So you all are in a fortunate position that through the city, your community has the ability to wait for that right window when to encourage that kind of development type. But I think to do something that would be a surface parked uh, uh, project, maybe, maybe, maybe on lot four surface parked might make sense, but if you, our opinion is on, on parcel five, uh, a structured parked mixed use environment is absolutely a home run. And your many, many uh, uh, you know, if rents are a dollar ten per square foot for residential right now, you're you're short by about fifty or sixty cents per square foot for those of you in the real estate business, I think, before that construction type makes sense. On the other hand, for the parcels along uh, Irving Boulevard. Uh, I think it should be a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I don't think you want to flood the market, but I think you want to be very careful. There are some adaptive, there's a lot of adaptive reuse opportunities, many buildings that are ready to be reinvented, and parcels that where new construction might make sense. And so I put up this uh, shot from Bishop Arts because I think uh, Bishop Arts gives us a lot of uh, insight as to what type of market makes sense and the kinds of development and the types of uh, tenants and the type of mix that makes sense. The question is, for, for, for me and I think for staff and I think for many of you is uh, without a central development authority, how, what's, the, what's the mechanism to link and leverage multiple businesses, investors and developers to create a managed environment. I mean, mall, whether you like a mall or not, a mall is very scientifically programmed. Uh, how the anchors relate to the inlines, how the inlines relate to one another, um, how you transition from one part of the mall to the other. They actually have just captured the science of good downtowns and they put them in a pure retail environment. Um, there needs to be at some point uh, more of a management structure, a, a clearinghouse, a way to organize from uh, property to property and business to business, the relationship. Uh, the Bishop Arts area is, is, is a place that is formally coordinated. Uh, it has multiple owners and investors, but there is formal coordination so that the business community actually coordinates uh, so that there's complement and synergy. But I don't think that you have to wait uh, for the potential participation by the city to catalyze some of that activity in the parcels that it controls. Uh, I have reviewed, uh, and I'll be honest with you, a little bit the district guidelines and the design, gu the district overlay and the design guidelines. Um, uh, they've been in place for a while. Uh, they're, they're pretty good. Uh, I think they're a little too prescriptive though uh, in terms of some of the architectural requirements. Uh, and there is some mixed use element in the core, uh, but I do think a comprehensive review of those two ordinances is really gonna be important because I just think the bottom line is, uh, my strong recommendation is, uh, other than the areas that are the transitional areas, many of which are now uh, subject to the RFP between the core downtown area and the single family neighborhoods, but in the core downtown area, my strong suggestion is let the market decide what uses should go into what buildings. Uh, let, let that be a matter of right. Residential office retail, uh, small fabrication, uh, coffee roasting, um, uh, even, uh, and when I say small fabrication, I mean uh, the, the goal here is not to sanitize downtown and get rid of uh, get rid of uh, what are perceived by some to be noxious uses. That's the point of downtown. 
and small businesses, I think, need a place to be, as long as they're not creating conflicts with their neighbors. Um, and the zoning ordinance it can be improved to continue to allow the widest variety of uses in downtown uh, with some additional rules to make sure, though, that if you're doing fabrication, you're doing it in enclosed spaces. Uh, it's not involving certain types of materials that would be a danger to others uh, and those sorts of things. But uh, the goal here is not to eliminate business. It's just to uh, make it easy if the market thinks that that business is appropriate. One of the things that we heard, this is a really very particular issue, but the city sign ordinance has a very strong limitation on the number of signs per building. Well, in a downtown environment, that works in a suburban building, and I get that. I served for four years on the downtown Fort Worth uh, design review board, uh, where you had to get a certificate of appropriateness for any kind of change in use or new construction or reconstruction or any zoning, you had to get a certificate of appropriateness from the design review board for anything that can be seen from the public streets or right away. Uh, material, colors, signage, all those things. It's very prescriptive in Fort Worth and in part it's because they've reached such a mature level of development that those that have invested a lot of money down there want their investment protected and they don't want anything and everything to come in uh, that is necessarily uh, not the highest quality design. You're not ready for that kind of design review. But one of the things that in larger format buildings you don't want is you don't want 13 signs on a building. It just doesn't look good. So in downtown Fort Worth, there are, there are rules about who gets a sign in a building. And usually it's the mat that you get one major tenant and depending on the building size, you might have, you might have the uh, right to have additional tenant signs on the building. I think that question needs to be very carefully looked at here because many of your buildings are appropriate for small professional offices and if you have potentially four or five or six professional offices or small retail in one building and you're only allowed one sign, then that business simply is not going to work. So those are the little things that I think the uh, city's ordinance needs to be analyzed for. That's just one example. Uh, and, and I would strongly recommend that that kind of analysis be undertaken rather soon. Um, the other thing that I point out in terms of my quick review of the ordinance is I really think it's important to focus on the pedestrian frontages and not necessarily the architecture. Um, my sense is, is that if you get the building right, if you get the basic function of it right, if it's, you get the orientation of it right and the parking right, and the pedestrian realm in terms of the private frontage and as, as it transitions to the street, uh, the public to the private, that okay architecture is, is, it works fine. And oftentimes you actually encourage better architecture. But when you try to overly prescribe the architecture and you do it at the expense of the, the urban context, then I think in a downtown, great architecture but really poor urbanism or poor walkable environments is, is not your goal. I think uh, great walkable environments, great, great pedestrian experiences, great cafes are, uh, with okay architecture, especially when you're in a market where affordability is critical. Uh, should be your goal. And so I would recommend that the ordinances be looked at <clears throat> to make sure that that balance is struck. I don't think there's that big of a problem, but again, these are nuances that can make the difference between a small business opening up and going from, uh, you know, $25,000 a month in sales to three or four million dollars a year in sales as a great restaurant because it had the opportunity to get started and its first six months were critical and it wasn't uh, it wasn't grossing the kind of revenue necessary to stay open for six months. If it had to take six months to go through a design process and get all the architecture absolutely correct uh, and get all the signage absolutely correct, for example. Six months, frankly, for a small business person is the difference of not opening and opening. Um, there was a question, uh, I think, uh, I think maybe it was Carol, I don't remember, but at the first meeting, there, I think there was a question about the boundary of the Heritage Crossing. I don't remember who asked it. I would encourage us, uh, not to call you out, but you're the neighborhood's representative, so I remember somebody had asked the question. Um, the green is the existing boundary, the purple is one of the proposed boundaries. The question was, do you pull in the boundaries in terms of the regulations and the focus? Um, 
I would suggest that that question be deferred until the other things that I've described in terms of the zoning, the ordinances, and some of the other questions in terms of what tools should be put in place. I think that should be answered at the same time because I think it would be arbitrary to reset the boundary right now for Heritage Crossing. Um, and so you have a TIF tax increment financing district that has been created, uh, but it's not been fully activated. State law allows cities and counties to capture some of the future value, uh, the taxes, the property taxes, and sometimes sales taxes, but in this case, the property taxes that are collected from the new assessed value in the corridor to be kept for reinvestment in that district as opposed to going to the general fund. That decision's been made. You have that kind of di district. The technical term for it is a tax increment reinvestment zone, a TERS. The term TIF and TERS are interchangeable. Um, uh, so I said that a project plan needs to be developed. That means that once a board is convened and a plan for how the money is to be spent, whether it's reimbursing somebody for redoing a little plaza around their building and they say, I spent $25,000 and I improved the frontage in front of my building, it's now a gathering space and it meets the reinvention of, Her uh, of Irving Boulevard that the city just spent a significant amount of money on, I can't do that $25,000 plaza improvement uh, unless I get some assistance. So what if you city give me 12,500 and we'll split it 50-50? And then that's the difference of me being able to redo this little courtyard or forecourt or not. And then as the money comes into the district, you can be reimbursed for that. Um, decisions haven't been made yet as to what policy should be put in place for that kind of reimbursement. And so my suggestion is as the project plan, the the policies for what projects should be eligible for that kind of reimbursement are developed, then I would recommend a couple of things. One of them is I'm going to say that it should not be about peanut butter. In other words, don't spread it all out so you uh, please everyone and do nothing. The policy should be developed so that the investments are catalytic or they encourage the kind of additional private investment that will lead to additional investments. Uh, uh, people coming into the district to spend money, increasing sales tax, increasing value, uh, encouraging redevelopment of a building or a parcel next door because now my neighbor has invested in their property and uh, it gives me motivation as opposed to an isolated investment that may be for purely aesthetic reasons and it sounded good but you can't really describe rationally or logically or from application to application why you would either allow or encourage that kind of investment or not and provide reimbursement. It's a little technical, but because you have the tool in place, I think it's a really important question going forward. Uh, and so the point is, is that there's not enough to do everything and what is it that needs to be prioritized? And that can be geographic within the boundary of the tax increment financing district. It can be through certain types of projects. And it can also be on a performance basis such that you are saying to the market, if your investment leads to a certain outcome, then you are eligible for a certain level of reimbursement. Uh, I also strongly recommend the consideration of a public improvement district. Uh, there needs to be some long-term capacity, uh, and that's uh, sometimes controversial. A public improvement district would be a, an applied for and voted on uh, district that would, uh, that could, doesn't always have to include, that could include a self-assessment uh, of additional, uh, uh, of an additional amount of revenue collected above the current property tax rate. I'm not encouraging that necessarily be done today, but at some point there needs to be a dedicated modest revenue stream that comes from the value created in the Heritage Crossing area to pay for the upkeep of the infrastructure and to have marshals and to have people picking up trash. Um, the reason downtown Fort Worth is so successful is that they have a no cigarette butt policy. Literally, the policy in downtown Fort Worth is, is that we as a community through downtown Fort Worth Inc., which is a nonprofit that contracts with the public improvement district and the tax increment financing district 
to have in place paid paid people to go throughout downtown and when they see trash it's picked up uh, if people have questions they answer them are you ready for that here no uh, do you need to put in place as soon as you can when it makes sense the ability to have that capacity someday absolutely if you really believe in your vision that you're going to someday have lots of restaurants lots of tourists lots of people getting off the train and having a great dinner or coming to see a professional in their office and getting back on the train and leaving uh, you've got to be able to manage it's an organism it's a lot it's it's alive downtown is, is alive and things that are living have needs and so if there's not uh, a way to continue to deal with those needs I promise you you're not going to be successful going back to the City Council and asking them to through the general fund and general appropriation give Heritage Crossing money for those kinds of things. So whatever the vehicle is, and I'm not suggesting it, I'm just saying, I'm not suggesting that the Public Improvement District is the correct vehicle, but there needs to be some management structure in place sooner than later. And then I think that vehicle then works with your existing partners, with Don at the Chamber and the Neighborhood Association and, uh, you know, many of the other, the Business Alliance and many of the other organizations, it becomes the clearinghouse for that. Downtown Fort Worth, Inc., how many of you are aware that once a month Downtown Fort Worth, Inc., Inc. and again, I, I, you know, it's, it's, a large, it's, a, it's a large, robust downtown, but the city of Irving is not a small town. It has a small town feel, but you're in a location where you could have a significant downtown someday in terms of its girth. Downtown Fort Worth Inc. issues once a month something called the dashboard. It talks about vacancies, rental rates, uh, the balance between the number of restaurants and residents. You know how many people are living on downtown. It's measured every month. It's the only way, ultimately, for you to track where there's opportunity and where there's need. It, it really is a shift to whether or not this is just uh, an ad hoc opportunity for individuals or whether or not you view downtown as a fully functioning and organized business. And then finally, um, I'm impressed with the commitment from the community. Um, you all are um, passionate. You're, uh, most of you have something at risk already financially, if not politically, and I mean that in the best sense because you uh, choose to stay involved and you want to do it because you have a reason to stay involved. And I really appreciate the opportunity from the council uh, and from staff to be uh, asked to just directly engage you. Uh, I was not given direction uh, to stay away from any particular issue. I was not told that there is a particular agenda and that if we see it going in one direction, it's my job to direct it into another direction. Uh, but what I was also told is that we need to use our experience uh, and our professional judgment to help you all and to challenge you all if what you're thinking or suggesting ultimately may feel like it's the right thing but may not necessarily be uh, uh, a path to success. I, I think very little of what we've done, frankly, is new information or new ideas. I think what we've done here is actually just coalesced and rationalize a lot of what's already happening so that you can put it together and leverage it. So uh, we don't want to lose that. I know there's been controversy about downtown and Heritage Crossing. My sense now is, is that you believe that the city is aligned with a long-term interest in making downtown very accessible and taking advantage of the significant investments they've already put in place and the significant investments you've already put in place. And so I think it's really critical for everybody in this room to figure out how to not lose that momentum. Some of it, I think, is going to be through some of these formal structures that I've described. Some of it is, candidly, the need for the uh, Heritage Crossing Neighborhood Association, the Business Alliance, and the Chamber to take it to the next level in a coordinated fashion, uh, and some of the other organizations. Uh, but you all, I think, are absolutely poised to do that, and everybody I've talked to is hungry to do that. Um, and to me, uh, part of it is something that I've heard repeatedly, which is let's be creative about some of the things that can be done that are outside the box today. Uh, creating market opportunities, creating incubator spaces, creating uh, active act, act activity 
that's not just uh, once a year festivals or, or episodic things, but where every Saturday there's a reason to come downtown, for example. Um, I, was a, uh, I wasn't a public critic. In this business, the first thing you don't do is criticize other people's uh, projects or ideas. Um, I'm for things, I'm not against things. But I promise you I have my own opinions about things that not, are not always positive. I absolutely thought the deck park in Dallas was going to be a colossal waste of money. Most of that was privately raised, but I, th I think 20 to 30 million was public. And then I think the rest of it, I think it was close to $100 million. I live near there, and it is incredible what has happened. Um, I ride my bike at night. I ride, I ride my mountain bike at night through the city. Um, and um, uh, I go over to the uh, deck park there in Woodall Rogers between uptown and downtown in the arts district. There are people hanging out at 10 o'clock at night on those green French folding chairs like Bryant Park in New York City and there are food trucks. I mean, that space is used constantly and it's programmed for it to be a place to hang out. Now, it was very carefully programmed. I don't think that kind of activity is going to be successful or occur until Irving Boulevard itself is completely reinvented through the core of downtown as I've described. But there might be some temporary things that can be done where there's some programming uh, and, and other things where uh, there is a, an encouragement of, of the hangout factor. But you can't dismiss the level of design and programming investment that was done with that park. And so I think getting it right in terms of connecting Main Street across the street to that incredible asset that you have in terms of that land and then ultimately the train station where there are already people riding by every day. Um, by the way, one of the great suggestions that you all came up with that I loved uh, is uh, over there by the train stop and some of the, and the park and, and the park and ride and some of the other city lots is to put up a big placard. And I think this might be something where all the organizations can work together and work with the city. And maybe we're not ready to do that yet because maybe the graphic has to be developed as, a, as an aggregation of a lot of the plans that have been done. But maybe a very large placard in three or four key locations, especially by the train station, that when you get off the train or you get on a bus or you park somewhere, there's a big physical plan that comes to, comes to life. And it tells people that those of you that are in business, we're here. You can come over here. Uh, and it can be updated. Uh, and it can include some more eclectic elements that are already in place in downtown. Um, it, I thought it was a great idea. You already have a captive audience. It's just right now they don't believe that there's any reason to necessarily hang out or stop. And maybe that's not a magic bullet, but it's a start. Um, and I think if people that are riding the train uh, by knew that they could get off and get a great patty melt with jalapenos at Big State, they would. Because there are not a lot of places left in this uh, North Texas region where you can go to the counter uh, in a, uh, an old, old school drugstore and have a great meal. It's just And people love that. And I, I'm, I've heard I need to come to breakfast. And I've been to a lot of different restaurants, so I don't want to just single out a Big State. But my point is there's already a lot here for people to come to. Uh, and so I've basically talked about that. Um, everybody asks when we get engaged for projects like this, what about the parking, what about the parking? I think it's premature to come up with a comprehensive parking strategy. Those are a lot of unanswered questions. Parking's not a problem down here. I think the bigger problem though, as Heritage Crossing and downtown becomes more successful, is transitioning from its appearance and function as a purely park and ride environment to a true downtown destination. And so that's a very complex set of issues. There are a lot of factors that need to be considered. I am one that believes that making it convenient to drive and to park is critical for the success of any urban core area. So I'm not about, unfortunately, a lot of my friends in the business, they kind of get into this. Well, if you make it hard for people to drive, they're just going to walk or they're going to ride the train or take the bus. Nah. If you make it convenient for people to choose whichever mode at the time makes sense for them for that particular reason or day or what they're doing that day or who they are, then they're going to use all of it. 
So for me, the question is choice. Right now, there is not a perception that walking is convenient or riding your bike is convenient. And even there's not a perception that taking transit is convenient unless you drive your car up to the station and park. Finally, on the issue of branding, somebody asked me, what should our theme be? How should we brand ourselves? Well, um, I think that is yet, that is a story to yet be determined. It has to unfold. Recently, uh, one of our clients, Roanoke, um, just adopted their new seal. Look at that. The city seal of Roanoke is the unique dining capital of Texas. That's a month old. Isn't that crazy? There's the old seal. There's the new seal. And they have literally taken upon themselves to formally brand themselves the unique dining capital of Texas. That wasn't something they decided uh, when, when we first started our work, when Babes was there in the Classic Cafe, but it emerged as the branded opportunity because it's the reality now there. They really are. Uh, and maybe, maybe there are more than one unique dining capitals in Texas, but they certainly, uh, they certainly can claim that they're one of the top. Uh, so I guess my point on the branding and marketing is it becomes obvious as the story unfolds if what you're doing is coordinated and leveraged. And it may be that there's multiple brands or there's different kinds of brands. But to me, to try and just market and brand something where you yet yourself have not determined what you are, uh, I think is premature. Uh, but it's not too early to start to think about it. And it's not too early to maybe have some informal focus groups. This is certainly something I'm sure Don, you and the chamber think about all the time. Uh, I know the city itself has done a tremendous job branding itself. Uh, and so I'm not discouraging the discussion. I'm just saying it needs to unfold so that the reality of what's happening is actually backing it up. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over. Thanks. It's been a pleasure so far. It's been, it seems like it's been a long time, but it's only actually been a couple of months. So, And I don't mean that in the, the negative sense. I mean that in the positive sense. We've covered a lot of territory together so far. So. Let's let Scott get a little drink of water here before we start our question and answer session. Um, We'll stay as long as you want, and like I tell everyone else, if you want to stay afterwards and visit with one of us, I'll, we'll gladly visit on that as well. Um, since we are recording this this evening, uh, make sure I'm going to hand you the mic, and um, you know, keep it about this distance is what they said, just so they can get it recorded, because we are going to have this, this is a tape delay, and we're going to have it on our website for others to look at who couldn't make it here with us this evening. So are you ready? All right, let's go ahead and start this up. I'll just start right up here. Uh, some, someone drew a great uh, way that the underpass or overpass railway should look, and I want to know when they're going to start doing that, painting it and putting up the signs and all that stuff. Lee, that's a concept we're still working through right now. We don't own the bridge, of course. It's, it, it belongs to, you know, DART, TRE. Um, we have visited with them on it. We have not made any definite plans. I like how it looks. I think it'd be a great entryway. But once again, there's, there's another agency we have to work through on that. Okay. There are people who paint bridges at night, you know. <laughs> Is that a threat? By the way, uh, one of the things that's really incredible is the level of planning and project level uh, analysis that's available. Uh, is that, uh, and frankly, Kevin is the keeper of the flame. He's got a lot of this information. And I think as things start to unfold, a lot of what needs to be done is already done, that it just needs to be refined or put into a particular context. There's a lot of stuff like what Lee pointed out already uh, planned and conceptualized. Hi, my name is Andy, and I was curious, what are you guys going to do about Hilltop between 6th Street and Shady Grove? You have it labeled as Avenue Y right now. I'll have to visit with you on that afterwards. I'm not sure exactly what the question is on that, but let, let's visit on that. That was a good slide. That's a perfect slide. Um, Th this I, one? Yeah, I was the one who asked about the boundaries oh, yes. um, a while back. So your recommendation is that the purple lines are the immediate area and the green boundaries are scrapped totally? Or no, that would be no, my future? recommendation is th th this was Kevin and I talking about if we were to bring the boundaries in, where would you do it? 
But my recommendation is to not make that decision now, to defer that question until this other analysis and work is done. Uh, looking at zoning reforms, uh, activating the TIF, how it would be done, uh, what kind of management structure needs to be put in place. Um, then the boundary, I think, will begin to become, uh, at least if not obvious, there will be more capacity to have the discussion, because otherwise I'm afraid if you start redrawing lines now, you're going to suggest winners and losers, and you can't explain necessarily why am I now no longer included, mm -hmm. or why am I still included. Mm -hmm. And I just think there, ti it's timing. The, it may make sense to redefine the boundary. I just think it's a, it's, it's a very important question. I just think it's premature to answer the question. Well, and I think by continuing to keep it as noted on the screen, it leaves folks within the entire green boundary thinking of the future and, yeah. of course, improvements and everybody striving, even though it might not be immediate. It might help the neighboring area there. And also the, the reality of, of urban cores and downtowns and the greater downtown, and I say that because this is, uh, Heritage Crossing is the greater downtown. Um, they're, uh, like I said earlier, they're living organisms, and the boundaries really are never going to be set definitively over time. They will change. They always will. Hi. I'm really hungry for a great place to go on Saturday and Sunday morning for breakfast. God, I hope it's in downtown Irving. And I love the fact that this boundary in green is a nice large area, and I think, wouldn't it be so great if all of these people in these neighborhoods, people who already live there, could get to downtown Irving via bike or working. And I like the fact that you are not going to make it the smaller area yet, but I think getting destinations right away where people can come and get a great breakfast on the weekend will really energize this area. Thank you so much for all your work. I think you did a great job. By the way, I you know I I I, I appreciate that comment, and it's 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 really been enjoyable to work on this project. We love what we do, and uh, when we first were approached, uh, we felt like this was a great fit. Ninety percent of what I've shown here is really just taking what what you all have been doing and talking about and putting it together in a meaningful way. So I really, you're the ones that deserve the credit, and candidly, staff deserves a lot of credit. Um, um, and so um, our job is to really be more facilitators and integrators, and hopefully to help you focus on what's going to be most effective. But really, 90% of this presentation is really yours. Residential RFP, when will it be released? Doug, do you want to? Sure, of course, we uh, did review that uh, RFP with the uh, Planning Development Committee la uh, last week. And so uh, we're currently taking that, uh, that RFP and wrapping it into our normal purchasing documents. It uh, should be on the street next week. You can go to our website now. Uh, if you are interested, go there, and you're going to need to register with us so we can get it to you electronically. So we'll go ahead and go there now to our website, register, and we'll get it to you at that time. It'll be, it should be there next week, though. Thank you. And I want to stress that it is uh, it, it, it allows for you if you're interested in partnering with the city or acquiring property to bid for some or some subpart uh, uh, of the parcels. Uh, so if you only have an interest in a smaller subpart or, or uh, just a handful of lots, then it still encourages that. But it says that if you're not pursuing the entire parcel uh, and you're just pursuing some, some lots within the parcel, uh, that what you propose has to be consistent with what make sense around you. Uh, but this was a strong uh, priority for the community uh, to encourage this eclecticism. But it also encourages proposers to come in, say, for example, a developer who would bring builders with them. And they might, for example, bring two or three different builders with them. And they might propose to take the entire parcel or two. I think there's different ways to get at the same outcome. And I, I I'm. I'm I'm emphasizing that because there have been a lot of discussions about that, but we really haven't talked about it very publicly, and I think it's important to give you some insight on the evolution of the RFP. Going back to what the young lady mentioned when she was talking about Saturdays, uh, of course, there's always Joe's Coffee Shop, but to the bikes 
is I've talked with Kevin and some other people about this, and I haven't heard any plans for bike trails or bike lanes or is any of that being considered and the other thing is is that in the entirety um well i'm talking about throughout the neighborhoods because there's yeah, a lot no, of I understand. neighborhoods there no i, I was going to respond to speaking that speaking of the neighborhoods and the people that already live in that area uh there's a program that the that the city's come up with for the improving fascias on buildings is there anything for the homeowners sure Oh, for the homeowners? For the homeowners in the residential areas. I mean, I have sure. a proposal on my website, but uh, sure. I'm not sure if anything like that has been proposed by you guys. Uh, let, me, let me answer the first two questions, and I'll turn it over to Kevin. Uh, what I didn't show, and I should have, and I apologize, is that there's an emerging bike system that's being developed uh, by the community, by Irving, and with the city and others to both be a, a com comprehensively accessible system within Heritage Crossing and also for connections to the rest of the city and the region. Um, uh, I understand there are some vehicles out there, some events coming up uh, in April. Uh, what's the, tell me the formal name of the event again in April? Shifting Gears. Shifting gears. Uh, every biannually, Bike Texas organizes a policy lecture and selects a noteworthy city that's made progress in its cycling and uh, infrastructure and um, engagement. And Irving has stood out in North Texas as one of the more engaged uh, communities in its advocacy and was uh, invited by Bike Texas to host this um, particular event. It'll be April 13th and it'll be hosted by the Irving Las Colinas Chamber of Commerce in Las Colinas. And I believe we have some bike lanes going in the urban center, is that right, Steve? Um, and so it's building and building. There's a bike fest on March 11th, May, May 11th. Thank you. On the facade program, uh, I know Kevin is still trying to work through how that's gonna be deployed, the commercial facade program. Our recommendation is that it's uh, kind of an incentive-based program and those that are willing to step up and invest are then matched. But I've got to defer on the question of improvements to uh, uh, residential properties. Okay. And I'll just talk just real briefly about the facade enhancement program. That's one of the components we currently have in place for downtown. We officially roll is that working. We officially rolled that out last Monday night at the chamber event where they had the Heritage Crossing Merchant Alliance meeting. This is a program to reimburse um, property owners for money spent on the facade of their buildings. It's all part about generating additional economic development, as Scott was visiting on earlier. And that program is currently active. We're currently taking applications for that. That's been funded in the amount of $100,000 for this first year. But if we have enough takers, I've been assured by council that we can fund some additional money. So that particular application form is available in paper from me, or you can go to our Heritage Crossing website and the form's on there, it's a fillable form, you can fill it out and print it and either scan and send it back to me or bring it to me in person, give me a call and we'll stop and visit about that. Other program we have in place right now is we do have, we understand how vital it is to maintain the appearance and vitality of our neighborhoods across the city. So with council support, we've been able to put in place a housing incentive program that's currently in a pilot program phase right now up in the Heritage Crossing District. That's a program that has two components. You can, either you can either make renovations to your existing house, or there's also a program that if your home is old enough, it's called a tier two, you can re completely repa replace an existing home with a new one. And there are different levels of reimbursement available on that as well. But that's in a pilot program phase up in the, in the, uh, in the uh, hospital district neighborhood. Depending how well that goes, we will look to market that to other neighborhoods across the city. Hospital district, yes ma'am. Actually, a comment on that. One of the things I'd love for you to consider is that maybe the house itself doesn't need a lot of work, but perhaps people would like to have funding to help improve their the appearance through their landscaping and to consider a landscaping component to that as well. Um, and, um, I, and then I have two, two questions. One is, um, many of us like to get rid of the name Heritage Crossing. We don't really feel that that's a, an appropriate name, and we're wondering if that's been tabled or 
or buried or where it's going with that. And along with that, the next question I have is, uh, we know the RFP is going out, but what are the next steps that are actually showing that we're moving forward? So um, let me answer the first question, then I'll hand the mic back over to Doug. Um, uh, I think I'm the appropriate person to answer the question about the Heritage Crossing name because I have no idea about the history of it, nor do I understand the politics behind it. So I'm going to give you the generic response, which is, if it doesn't work for you all, then, and now that you all have come back and you're, you're communicating and you're coordinating, that goes to the branding question, and I think it's on the table. Uh, but there may be reasons that you don't want to abandon it. Uh, but I think you need to go through a process over time to figure that out. Um, however, I would say be careful that it doesn't devolve down into a beauty contest where it's something where you like or don't like something. A lot of times names are used because there's a long-term uh, identification and when you abandon them for one reason, you may lose the benefit of that historic reference for another reason. So I don't know anything about the detailed background. I just know that you need to be very, very careful when you walk away from something that's been in place. Um, and also a lot of times businesses actually have already done direct branding themselves. That's why when people try and change street names it's very controversial oftentimes because it causes small businesses to have to spend a lot of money even though it makes sense. So if that happens the city might consider some sort of support for businesses that are impacted by that. But I think that's part of that longer term branding conversation. So the next question was, uh, what are the next steps on the bids? Is that what? Well, where are we going next? In other words, this is great, but I don't want to see us just kind of have everything disappear and once again in another year we're revisiting. We want to, I think most of us in the community want to see you know, clear, definite, what are we doing next steps? You know, that type of thing. And, and what is the city addressing and what should the community be addressing to move us, move it forward? That's a little bit, that's beyond obviously the bids. Uh, I will say on, on the bids though that the, the good thing there is that, uh, you, you know, as a re direct result of those bids, uh, you would hope to see some new construction downtown and, and especially on the creek obviously. And then also repurposing of the building that we own at 222 uh, Irving Boulevard, so those would be some very uh, visible and real results uh, in the short term. Uh, the next steps would be uh, considering what other land pieces uh, would go out. Originally, if you recall, we had some other land uh, in the original uh, bid uh, proposal. It was pared down, and so we would th then look and see if, the, if it's the right time to come out with those other properties uh, for additional uh, opportunities there. So those would be some more real results. And then Urban Boulevard piece, we've been working, Kevin's been working hard on that as far as uh, making that happen. It's a question of uh, funding, of course. And we're working for a number, of, you know, looking at a number of different sources for that. You know, we're always looking for grants and, and, and those kinds of things. TxDOT has grants, you know, COG has grants. Uh, they have, uh, I believe the next call for projects for the COG is 2014. And now that's not what we want to hear here. We want to get something, you know, done now. And so that makes it uh, tough to work in those time frames. But we're still looking for funding. I don't know if, Kevin, you have anything else to add to that. But yeah, it, I think Doug's touching on it real well. We have the public piece we're working on Irving Boulevard. We're looking right now at improving Irving Boulevard from the split at Strickland Plaza back to Britain as a phase one. We're already in the engineering phase on that. I sat in a meeting a couple weeks ago. They already identify where the underground utilities are because you know, anytime you do a street project, you got to find out where the utilities are. It's the first thing that has to be moved. But that particular proposal would incorporate the, you know, the sidewalks and the trees and the landscaping, pedestrian lighting that we want along the boulevard. At least I hope that's what we're looking for along the boulevard. Um, the other piece we have right now from the private side then would be releasing this RFP for housing development. So we actually have two pieces going on right now. We can't rest on that though as you're alluding to right now. So over the next several weeks while this RFP is out as a staff and with our leadership team, we're going to look see what the next steps are. Um, whether that's just something, you know, staff related or if we potentially retain Gateway or another firm to help us with 
further evolution of what some of these ideas might be. They've taught us a lot of neat things. They really opened up our eyes, some new refreshing ideas on how to do things. And I think we've learned a lot. And I think we can grow on that. Um, but that's something we have to discuss among our staff to see what those next steps are. But I'm very pleased to say we have the street piece going forward and we, from the public side and then the housing from the private side. Scott, I just wanted uh, to say thank you for facilitating the communication that has occurred in this community. Um, Councilman Galloway, Councilman Ferris, um, the city staff has interacted both with Scott as a facilitator and also with uh, Neighborhood Association Board and other members of the community to develop many things in the past two months. And it's a positive experience to be able to sit in this facility and talk about what's going to happen in the Heritage District, Heritage Crossing, uh, in a positive way, rather than coming down to City Hall and having to say, but, 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 but. And that's happened because of the communication, and I do hope that we are able to keep that communication open. Agreed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the RFP for the sign building? We haven't touched on that well tonight. I think it's it's going to be out uh, issued at the at the same time is that not correct I yes we're gonna we're gonna uh, have that advertised the same time that the residential RFPs are I call them, call them, it's bids is what they are as a bid I'll be careful with the terms uh, it'll be advertised the same time that the uh, residential bids are out on the street so it should happen next week we'll have those out available you've already seen the actual bid part of it, we just again wrap it up into the normal uh, bid documents that all the legal documents go with that uh, and then we'll come, we'll get those bids in and see what we get. I, I wanted to point out one other thing you mentioned, uh, results and things we're doing. Uh, you may notice uh, we are working on the 222 building right now. We just completed the asbestos abatement on that building. Uh, there's a one small piece going to come back I think on March the 9th and finish out some area under a couple of walls, get the asbestos out, then we come back in after that and remove some of the interior walls that are, that are in there and kind of get it cleaned up, ready for, for that. Uh, also, you might look at the 127 building we own on Main Street. We're doing the same thing there. We're getting that building um, cleaned out, gutted out, and ready for redevelopment. So we want to, uh, when that gets uh, into basically the envelope that's prepared for a business, we can get that advertised out and, and move forward on some other businesses downtown as well. So things are happening. It's, it's currently back in. It's 127. Uh, you might see them there on Main Street right now. They're just finishing up this week, I think, on the asbestos abatement. They're working from the back. You see the front of it's got the, you know, the, uh, the, the cardboard or the paper in the front window to kind of close it off. But they're working from the back side of that building uh, to get it uh, uh, ready for a new business to go in and uh, get it cleaned up. So it should add some life down there as well. I was thinking about one thing, though, the, about the Irving Boulevard Initiative and Second Street. One thing that has really been um, a universal for us as we've worked in other communities on projects like that. Um, for example, the, the redo of the, of the square in McKinney, in downtown McKinney, which we oversaw. Uh, we, we've been doing a, a much larger uh, town center project for many, many years. But we literally had to work block face by block face and storefront by storefront. And so one of the things that I've been working with staff on is, is that, yes, the engineering department needs to get the utilities right, need to get the traffic operations right. But in going to the design process, the process needs to literally engage every property owner and every storefront all the way down the street to make sure that the public frontage that's going to be designed and implemented uh, either uh, enhances or preserves what the private frontage is at least doing at that time for that business. And there are some challenges. Uh, we did, that was our role uh, when Main Street, the first four blocks of Main Street in Duncanville was redone as a follow-on to the work we did in Duncanville for the master plan and the rezoning there. Uh, and. Um, 
a lot of what we had to do was to try and work with the property owners to understand what their future might look like, but their future was not going to be there for another five years or so. So they may have a business where they're saying today, this is how I need it to function. I could see my business and my storefront differently in five years, but I have to function over the next five years. And so the implementation of a new vision for Second Street and Irving Boulevard as a destination, a linear destination, is not just an exercise of a linear cross-section uh, that, a, or I, sh I should say, a typical cross-section. So we showed you some typical cross-sections, but that's the starting point. Um, the actual design is going to have nuances and changes literally from block to block, and it has to be designed and en engineered as such contemporaneously. You're talking about communication. communication. That's, that will be critical uh, uh, on an ongoing basis through the project. Most people worry about the construction phase uh, in terms of in impacting their business. But when you're redoing downtown streets, it's just as important that the property owners and the tenants are at the table during the design process. I've been working with uh, Don for probably about two months now with the University of Dallas. We have students that are working in marketing, we're doing focus groups in the next two weeks. Um, and a couple of things just come to my mind since I'm a, mar a marketing person. Uh, there's several ways to grow. One way would be to increase the usage and the, the amount of spending from the immediate market area. If you want to take, say, a mile or two, a circle around that area, and those people would, would naturally be attracted to, to a heritage environment. Um, but to date, the demographics are not strong enough to sustain that growth, okay? So you have to look beyond the immediate market area to whether it's Las Colinas, whether it's a hospital district, and say, we've got to bring in new people. And of course, the, the catch-22 here is, to do that, you need those key attractions. You need those restaurants like Roanoke has. You need a movie theater, you know, revitalize the theater down that's already there downtown. Uh, find a niche, some kind of a niche market there that would attract people from Las Colinas, from Grand Prairie, people who would want to come in, take the rail, come in for the day, et cetera, et cetera. And if you could do that, you'd, you'd really, uh, you wouldn't have to worry about the existing demographics because I think the, the increase in housing and apartments and et cetera, et cetera, would take care of themselves. My question, I think, is in trying to attract people uh, or to attract key businesses, okay, a TGI Fridays or an Applebee's, let's say, uh, the, the numbers aren't there right now. So why can't we do what we did in, in Las Colinas when I, I was a board member of the chamber back in the 80s when we gave uh, tax incentives to bring business to Las Colinas? Uh, has that been discussed about offering businesses a, an incentive to to build in heritage? I think that's part of my recommendation going forward. Um, I think it's a, it's a really, uh, those tools are really critical, uh, but they need to be uh, implemented in a way that you are attracting the kinds of businesses that will be catalytic and sustainable. I think your description is right on. Um, by the way, I met with some of your students in McKinney. It was great. They're very sharp. I was very impressed. Uh, and um, um, looking at it from a business and marketing perspective was, uh, was a great conversation. Um, I'm excited to see the results of your class's work. And I, I have a feeling that it's going to be very helpful uh, uh, for the initiative going forward. I think it's really super important to align the types of businesses and restaurants with the culture of an eclectic downtown. Um, not to, I don't know how to describe this without suggesting that certain things should not be considered. Um, we've worked, uh, over a long period of time now in about a dozen significant historic downtowns. And so we've, we've just, you know, m more anecdotally than not, just seen what's working, what's not working. 
the common element for us is an aggregation of restaurants. Uh, and yes, uh, drinking establishments and places where people uh, 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 hang out after a certain hour. We're finding in Roanoke right now that the early evening and the weekend business is great, but after nine or so o'clock, they're not now attracting in businesses that should be there. In McKinney, it's working because there are businesses that are, are there from between nine and midnight or so. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily do what other communities are doing, but I am telling you that the communities we're working in, there are different time of day markets, and depending on what you want to attract, uh, those different time of day markets actually begin to relate to one another in terms of being able to sustain them, uh, uh, specifically around the question of hospitality, restaurants, and that sort of thing. That's one point related to your, to your, to your uh, I think, excellent characterization. I think the second point is that they need to be establishments that are, that I'll go back to the, my phrase, the hangout factor. Um, and so I, what we see a lot that is happening a lot are the regional, the regional restaurants, not necessarily the national credit tenant restaurants, but the regional restaurants that are really highly well managed uh, they might be just in North Texas. They're not necessarily the one-off, but they're not necessarily the franchise type that have the formula that when you walk into it, it's no different than the, the one that you're going into when you get off the highway when you're driving from Texas to Colorado to go skiing. So I, I just, I'm not suggesting that the National Credit Tenant restaurant, restaurant is not appropriate, but what I found is that the regional restaurants are the ones that tend to have the ability to modify their um, their program and their marketing and their genre for the particular downtown that they're deploying that particular restaurant in. And so I think that's uh, the common uh, characteristics you see whether you're in Lower Greenville, Deep Ellum, Bishop Arts, Roanoke, McKinney. Uh, I think that's going to start to happen in Mansfield, um, Grapevine, uh, and I think that's our sense, and then I, this is true for our work when, in, in other places. There's a wonderful emerging uh, restaurant row on Central Avenue in Albuquerque that we're trying to figure out how to take advantage of. So I'm not trying to exclude the national credit tenants, nor am I trying to suggest that the, 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 the single uh, proprietor, uh, what is euphemistically called the mom and pops, are not appropriate. Both can be done well. Uh, but what I'm, what I, the, the common thread that I see oftentimes is the four or five or six regional restaurants that tend to have the ability to adapt for their particular downtown environment. Yeah, Brian, I didn't, I may have misled, misled you, but uh, the city council has provided us with a, uh, several different uh, tools in our toolbox to offer incentives two companies to bring them in, and we have offered those in the, in the past. So I had uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first one was, when we first met with you in towards the beginning of the year, you explained it was a 60-day agreement. So I think this may be a city-answered question, but uh, if you've made your fulfillment, is, is there going to be an announcement of a retention of him or the group, or if not, is there going to be the new group coming in that's going to be looked at for this? And then the second question is, if they are retained or another group comes in, um, they're hired and paid by the city, uh, but as an individual or, a, or an investor, are we going to be able to approach and work and, and give ideas to you uh, and, and you help with that, or is that they only help the city? Does that question make sense? I'll go ahead and address that. As I, go down here. As I indicated earlier, we've been very pleased with what we've seen and what we've heard with gateway planning. I think at this standpoint, if there was, you know, to move forward with, you know, further consulting services, this would probably be our primary candidate at this point. But those are all things we have to discuss internally. Um, I, I can't say enough about what he's done in terms of communication processes opening our minds how to reach people how to reach different audiences and do and, and succeed at that he's put a lot of time in 
Um, again, he's, it's a firm that really understands how downtowns work. As you've probably heard tonight, things we hadn't heard before that just really make sense. I didn't think about that. You know, just a lot, a lot of those little things. Um, the, second, the second part of your question um, is, if we brought him back, of course, it'd be the same group. Uh, the second part of your question, if we did bring back someone else, we would really continue to build on this model of the communication that's worked for us so, worked for us so well thus far. To follow on about bringing in restaurants, um, most restaurants coming in want to be able to offer some form of alcohol. Currently, um, basically, the way our church structure is in the downtown area would prohibit most um, restaurants to provide alcohol, as I understand the ordinances. Is the city working on that or considering or expressing in the RFPs the opportunity that something can be worked out so that though that ordinance can be modified. Been waiting all night for my opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the city council has already begun to address that. Uh, back in 2008, uh, they adopted an ordinance that basically said that the council could grant a variance to those separation requirements between a church, a school, a residence, a hospital, and a place wishing to sell alcoholic beverages. Uh, the council expanded their ability to do that uh, in January when they did the other changes to the RAB ordinance, so they now have that ability citywide. And so if a restaurant that we really want to be successful in Heritage Crossing comes through, they can submit the same zoning application as any other restaurant wishing to sell alcoholic beverages, and we just take that to the council and include as part of that request that the council approve a variance to those separation requirements. So that opportunity is there. Uh, we just have to uh, recruit the restaurant to come in to, to apply. I think, Kevin, I wanted to ask two questions, please. The first is, are you ready now for the developers to come in and do the quality development that you want? Say yes. Okay. The other question is, are you going to redo the overlay zoning that we had some years ago, or is that going to be necessary? So well, my, my suggestion is that it be fully analyzed. Yeah, it, 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 it may not need wholesale change. I don't think it does. But on the other hand, there may be uh, a, a desire to go to more of a form-based approach where uh, you're really focusing mainly on the form of the public spaces and how the buildings address the street and how the parking is structured. And you go to a much more open-ended management of uses. But you already have mixed use in some locations. Um, uh, I know these guys have been living this for years and years and years and years. Um, my suggestion, though, is whatever is done, it's not done on a reactive basis uh, in reaction to one concern. It's done so that it's strategic, so there are not unintended consequences, or at least they're minimized. I think there is a need to look at it, is the bottom line. Oh, here, one more. But also, I've got to tell you, there is also a need to look at policy on, on uh, building code and how things are reviewed, how they're enforced. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that to be critical because building code uh, issues are health and safety issues. There's a lot of liability and especially when you're talking about buildings that are connected to adjacent buildings. Um, on the other hand, um, a lot of times there are gray areas and the difference of getting a business moved in the right direction or not is a matter of interpretation of a particular uh, provision of the building code. And so um, th that's a very complex question. I put it on the table because I think it's one that ultimately is going to have to be tackled directly. Uh, but there is not going to be a pat answer. It's going to have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but candidly, part of it is your building officials have to understand that they have the support of the leadership of the city in terms of their particular perspective on how they handle tough questions. Uh, and my experience in working for public uh, entities, especially ones that have a lot of liability on the line, is that um, uh, most people are empowered to say no, and they are not empowered to say yes. Uh, and I think you have to figure out if there are things that need to be reinterpreted. It's not the building official's job to establish that policy. It's the policymaker's job to establish that policy. 
And so that's uh, maybe a discussion that's worth having at some point. And I just make that observation in that the bottom line is that really is something, and I hope I'm not putting the council on the spot by saying this, but oftentimes that issue is not properly addressed until that conversation is held at the council level so that staff is empowered to actually then uh, look at more creative uh, solutions. Oftentimes the building officials are made out to be the bad people and they're frankly not at all because they're doing what they're empowered to do. Scott, we appreciate greatly what you've accomplished uh, in the 60 days uh, that you've been involved with the project, walking into a difficult situation. Uh, your ability to bridge some of the gaps and create the communications that are, that are desirable and necessary have been, uh, should be well complimented and are well recognized by a number of people from a number of directions. Does tonight represent your final deliverable uh, under your current contract? It does, and we went kind of back and forth on the, on the nature of it. Uh, we could have written up a report and I could have put a bunch of boilerplate in it, which we, we're not boilerplate guys. And so in discussing this with Kevin, what we decided was, and there's a lot of other work product that we have generated, but what we decided was a really strategically organized set of recommendations in a PowerPoint that could be modified for a presentation to other groups, to the council or whatever, uh, was the way to go so that there's institutional memory that this is really our best judgment on the critical path going forward to continue the momentum. But this is our final deliverable. I think there are a number of us individually and collectively that would strongly recommend to the, to the staff as well as the council that you or someone um, similar continue. Um, I personally um, I'm appreciative and complimentary of the work that you've accomplished thus far um, and would advocate um, an RFP by the city um, to seek your services in the future in this continued endeavor. Thank you much. Okay, so people have mentioned restaurants and, you know, everybody normally eats three times a day. So I think, you know, a restaurant down here would be the big draw. And I mentioned that, you know, uh, set track nine, that we do something like a land lease so the uh, restaurant person wouldn't have to worry about acquiring land. I wanted to put about four restaurants on there and the city uh, build the, uh, the infrastructure and the, I mean, like the parking and let the restaurateur uh, build the buildings. The other thing was uh, when we're talking to these restaurants, we need to maybe de-emphasize the people who live around here and emphasize that 100,000 cars go through this part of town, which is all the demographics, but everybody seems to be just focusing on who lives here, not who could pass through here. So is this a difficult thing to, uh, to have a land lease where the city own, continues to own track nine and therefore you know, release the restaurant owner from all of the expense of the land and the parking lot building. Well, I, I, I think that's a very interesting idea. In fact, as you know, we've rendered this up to sort of begin to explore exactly what that might look like. Um, the building type here was, was put in just to show that you can do good commercial buildings in a very sensitive scale. But in terms of the rendering to the left, I mean, I think that sort of captures your concept there. Um, uh, sure, of course the city can do a ground lease. Um, I would strongly discourage the city going beyond that and getting into the management of what you might, you know, you, uh, for example, San Antonio tried that in the Mercado. Uh, you've got to be careful about the city kind of crossing the line and getting into the proprietary side. I think you, this is a personal opinion, not a recommendation, but I think you drew the line very well, which is the city sets up the environment joint ventures in the infrastructure uh, helps 
coordinate and bring people together, but then you let the market decide how the businesses will relate to one another and the management side there. Although, I do think that from time to time it does make sense for there to be public support for a particular business if they can show very carefully with a market study uh, and with a pro forma that a little bit of support could go a long way to bring in a very significant long-term cash flow uh, uh, for success. On the question of, uh, I think it's similar uh, to the professor's point about the market, it's both. It's, it's just fundamentally both. Uh, I, I think to, to, to say is it, uh, is it the, the market here, the neighborhoods here, uh, the people that live here, or is it the destination traffic? Uh, uh, urban cores require both to be successful. Um, uh, how many of you all have gone on the east side of the historic square of, of downtown McKinney? It's a very modest neighborhood, much more modest demographically than around here, much more modest. And also, and like Bishop Arts, and also, even the Cracker Barrel well, out but, on 35. But they're stable neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, we did an analysis in our early planning. The neighborhoods east of the square in McKinney are 65% owner occupied. And no, there are not enough people that live within uh, a half a mile over or a mile, even if they were making median household income of $80,000 a year to support the kind of destination businesses that you want here. The demographic level of incomes around, immediately around this downtown, <coughs> are not one way or the other going to impact your success. If you do not attract destination traffic from all over the Metroplex, you will not be successful, hands down, period. And so my point is, what I love about what's going on in the neighborhoods around here is that they're stable, they're small businesses, uh, and they're a great base to build from. Um, and so I think that some businesses will be uh, looking for destination traffic, and frankly, others are going to continue to look from the business space they already have, which is basically the neighborhood base. Uh, and if you don't have both neighborhood serving businesses and destination driven businesses, then I think you're not going to sustain redevelopment. You've got to have both. If for no other reason, you don't want your downtown and the greater heritage crossing to be um, ultimately successful on a Friday and Saturday night because you have a bunch of great destination restaurants, but then for the rest of the time, it's empty. It's the same reason right now downtown Dallas is struggling and uptown Dallas is doing really well. Hopefully the deck park will bridge it and they'll start the balance again. But when everybody goes home at five o'clock in downtown Dallas, it's a ghost town. Uh, when everybody goes home from all, uh, there's a ton of class A office in uptown now. When everybody goes home uh, uh, after, uh, uh, work uh, in Uptown at their Class A office space or they've finished eating lunch, uh, after 5 o'clock it's still rocking because there's neighborhood serving businesses and people live there. So I would strongly discourage any more conversation about which demographic are we trying to attract and support. You need everybody, build on the neighborhoods you have and attract as many people as you can from as far and wide around the Metroplex as possible. Excuse the soapbox, but I think it's um, I think it's an important question if you're the particular entrepreneur that's opening the business, where's my market? But it should be business-based or project-based, but as far as trying to answer that question for all of Heritage Crossing, that, I don't, it, you'll just stay in a catch-22, because I don't think there's one answer. So how does Heritage Crossing or the city of Irving get the attention of those people who don't know we're here but might put in a destination Radically restaurant. reinvent Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street. Uh, create this feel when you drive through it that says when I've arrived, literally driving, if I were to try and drive 55 miles an hour through there, it would feel uncomfortable and it would be inappropriate. And that I want to drive at 25 to 30 miles an hour because it feels right. And that people actually uh, begin to open up cafes and businesses on the street, that's the way to tell people. That's the common denominator, is the city needs to do what it does well, that's infrastructure. The city needs to do what it does well, that's creating a regulatory environment that attracts the right kind of businesses and is friendly to the developer and the builder that is willing to do the right project. 
Uh, and, but, then, but then I think you'll be shocked. I think you'll be shocked. If those two things are done right and we have strong recommendations that both those be done, and I, again, I don't think it's necessarily a wholesale revision of your regulations, but it's a very strategic and careful analysis of all of them to understand what's working and what's not and how they relate. But is a wholesale reinvention of Irving Boulevard and Second Street and active, Kevin has asked me several times, what about Main Street? What do you think? What's your opinion? Main Street will take care of itself if we do Irving Boulevard and Second Street correctly. I think. Now, does it need support and help? Sure. But Main Street's, Main Street's got great bones. It's, it's, it's working. The market will come to you. And the leakage you have from Irving will be reversed. There are a lot of people in Irving, you, you have, make tourists out of your own citizens. Hi, the TRE is uh, pretty vital for this area as well. And to get people to get off the train and use it as a destination, do you think that an entertainment value, such as, I don't know, an amphitheater or hmm. you know, something that can integrate with the mixed use, residential and commercial, as well as the dining, but a reason to get off the train. I think in the long term, that's a really important point. I think in the long term, absolutely. No question about it. Um, I do a lot of work in the rail business, a lot of work. Uh, and I can tell you that I've studied a lot of the locations of TODs, transitory developments, and potential TODs around this region and around the state. And this is one of the most important and critical transit destinations in the entire region, especially because the TRE has the potential to connect up eventually to Carrollton and to Frisco and to, Air <laughs> and to interline with the Cotton Belt. And what that means is that someday this location will be virtually accessible to about three to 400 miles of rail transit. Think about that. That's a big deal. Having lived in Washington, D.C., traveling a lot for the work I do, I can tell you that one of the choices that I made when I moved to Washington, D.C. was living on a transit corridor and on a station so that in terms of a lot of my entertainment, we gave up a car and we were able to do a lot of things by taking the train to other key destinations in the rail system. You all have the very, very strong potential to be one of those key destinations. And I think thinking about that and preparing for it is important. I don't think that's an early, uh, that should not be an early driver, but you should set yourself up for that opportunity. That's an excellent point. In other words, be thinking 10, 15 years out and make sure that you don't forego the opportunity. Now what it should be, I don't know, you know. But you have a lot of land. I know we keep talking about this. You are blessed with land, and you also have that triangle. I know that's controlled by the railroad, but there are a lot of possibilities. Be thinking about them, continue to talk about them, um, and position for them. Scott, along that same line, has there been, has there been talk about um, bringing folks' attention to downtown Irving and Heritage Crossing? much sooner than before you arrive at the station. So there are stops as far out as, uh, you know, even from coming from Fort Worth or anywhere on the train where folks could see that there will be, you know, you're this far from Heritage Crossing and kind of teasers to it's a great get idea. people to think before if they weren't gonna, if they weren't gonna stop. I think it's a great idea. I, I think that needs to be done at the station and I think that's a possibility. Now you'd have to negotiate because that right away is, you know, controlled by the transit authorities, but I think that would, could be f some fun marketing if it's done appropriately. It'd have to be done very carefully. There, there's liability issues, there's maintenance issues, but once there's a wayfinding and marketing strategy that begins to unfold, um, uh, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, it, it, think of the power of being between, on a rail line between the CBD of Dallas, Texas and Fort Worth, Texas. And then someday, being able to say to folks that live in downtown Dallas and downtown Fort Worth, you know, gee, get on the train and come here for the evening. 
instead of getting on the train to go work in downtown Dallas or downtown Fort Worth. And maybe you do both. I grew up outside Chicago and did the commute. And the old Chicago and Northwestern station, may it rest in peace, was a wonderful gathering place. And if we could take that triangle and turn it into an incredible eatery gathering place so people could easily come in and then they obviously somehow do a connection to activities that are going on in downtown. But that would be a win-win a, a for everybody and to take that piece that's not being used and really make it a powerful eatery location would be incredible. I agree, and, I, and, and Kevin, this is the thing that Kevin keeps bringing up. I really appreciate your vision, Kevin. Uh, the arrow, the blue arrow there is if we never are back ever again, one of the things that we want to make sure is that the, the clues that we've left in here are remembered. That blue arrow is critical to that being successful. There has got to be the feel from Main Street between Irving Boulevard and 2nd through both development, design, aesthetics, and the development types, all the way to that triangle, so that every linear step that somebody takes, it's a great experience, it's a strong experience, and there has to be a very detailed plan that should unfold sooner than later about what that experience is gonna be like. Because if all we do is really improve the, um, the function and aesthetic of Irving Boulevard and 2nd Street so that when people are driving through, they feel like they've arrived, but we fail to make that connection north-south, both through the horizontal infrastructure, the development that occurs there, its permeability. Somebody's gonna come in someday and they're gonna make a proposal for parcel five, parcel four, it's just as important to gauge the efficacy of that proposal for the relationship of being able to have a sense of permeability through it or around it or however it's achieved as it is in terms of the development itself. If you all truly believe that what's happening to the north is also an opportunity. Now that's a very abstract thing and you can't begin to even consider what that would be like, but you can put in place the policies that say if those properties are, are, are facilitated through bids at some point, it's not just the economic impact or the function of that particular site, it's also how it relates to Main Street, how it relates to Irving Boulevard, how it relates to the Triangle, how it relates to the reinvention of the uh, park and ride. Park and ride should always be a park and ride, but as you know from your experience in Chicago, there's, the, the, especially the line going north uh, up Lakeshore is phenomenal the way they've integrated the park and rides and the, the old historic downtowns and the train depots. Just, you know, the stuff's been done well over and over and over again. The um, surrounding communities of where you're going to do the development, uh, a large portion of them are single family homes. They have values of 80, 90, 100,000. Um, what is going to be the tax impact on those homes um, in terms of once the development is made? Well, that's the first question. The second question is what kind of activities are going to be developed in that area that will benefit you know, 80 to 90 percent of the people who live uh, within close proximity of that area? That's the second question. And then third, what is going to be done you know, beyond uh, this second street going from you know, Loop 12 down Irving Boulevard where there are a lot of Hispanic businesses, what kind of infrastructure and investment is going to be made to those Hispanic businesses that have for many, many years been a very strong economic, you know, vibrant part of Irving. And so it seems like they're always being neglected. And yeah. so what steps are being taken to stop the neglect of providing services to those businesses who have been here for a long time. Sure, all excellent questions. Let me take them in reverse order. And I wanna say that this is, this, the, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're speaking to the core question in many respects. Um, and I appreciate your, your questions. There are no simple answers for sure. Um, I think part of the solution is that those questions need to be continually asked. That's an ongoing and never ending dialogue, number one. I think that's the kind of the basic point. Your third question 
I think I can answer by just the way we've seen things unfold. So for example, in our work in McKinney, now we're now tackling what's happening up and down McDonald Highway 5. The success we had in the core and even the success of the historic core now on the other side of Highway 5 where the future rail station is in the old cotton mill that's being redeveloped around some very similar neighborhoods where you have predominantly uh, modest households, predominantly uh, Hispanic and African American households, and a lot of elderly. Um, so up and down Highway 5 where you have a lot of neighborhood serving or auto-oriented uh, businesses, there's going to be a very careful analysis of how to improve Highway 5 and yet not displace those businesses and facilitate <coughs> Uh, either their preservation or if those businesses or properties choose to reinvent themselves, what's the context in which they would reinvent themselves? So I think the short answer is, is that the city should take seriously the further reaches that you've described as success occurs here. In terms of the question of gentrification, um, I mean, that, that's incredibly tough. Um, uh, I don't know if the city has adopted, nor am I promoting the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, f the freeze on the, uh, the essential tax base for, for the elderly. I don't know if that's, is that something the city's... Well, that's, that's a critical issue because, you know, if you, if you go down, you know, the 6th Street, 11th Street, 12th Street, and you go down the home... You have a lot, a lot of elderly. Of yeah, you have yeah. a lot of senior citizens. Yeah, so and one so, of... Yeah. You know, if you look at other cities, for example, Farmer's Branch, tried to do something very similar, you know, one of the biggest opposition that they had was from senior citizens concerned about the tax yeah. rate going yeah. up. Yeah, it's and critical. I, that question has to be understood and, and it has to be answered, although I don't think there's ever going to be uh, a um, completely successful solution uh, because it's the classic paradox, which is in order for you to have a successful reinventing, redeveloping environment, you're going to see value increases, no question about it. Um, my sense also, though, is that the city is also very good at going directly at particular uh, challenges. Uh, for example, I didn't know about the homeowner assistance program. That's amazing. A lot of cities don't offer that. Creativity is going to be the key. There needs to be a willingness to not have kind of a one-size-fits-all answer. Um, I wish I could give you more specific responses right now. I think it's going to be maybe the personal, the personal, uh, you can see I'm struggling with how to answer this. I think the personal response I'll give you, I'm not speaking as a consultant right now, I'm speaking as an individual, is to engage the city leadership over time to convince them that taking that question head on and solving that problem as it can be solved is just as important for those that are the ones investing in the businesses as it is for those that are on the limited incomes and are looking at displacement. Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, the great neighborhoods and great central cities of the United States are the ones that still have a lot of variety of ethnic uh, residents, of incomes, uh, and um, uh, great neighborhoods are all about that. And so, again, this is more philosophy than it is technical, um, but I think it's critical that there's a proactive engagement uh, my sense is that your city leadership is going to be responsive and interested in that question. I, I, I'm sorry I don't have anything more to say about that at this point, but um, I just think it's a, it's a perennial question that can never be fully answered and it has to be um, looked at on an ongoing basis. You're, 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 say that again, you said... I think that's where the battle lines are going to be drawn because here you, you're going to ha you have a lot of senior citizens, you have a lot of Hispanics, and you can't you know, basically ignore a you know, almost dominant population of, of senior citizens and Hispanics. And so I totally agree. I, I think that the, the issue has to be how does a city address those issues as part of the overall plan? And I Absolutely don't think that agree. has been done. Well, and you want to address them so it's not, quote, a battle line. That is the point. Again, my point is, is that there has to be a direct relation shown that, that solving that question as best as can be done is just as important to the decision of how much rents are for a market rate mixed use building next to the train station. I completely agree with you. And if there will be a moratorium on taxes for senior citizens also. Well, I probably just lost my next engagement if there isn't one in place now. Is there? Has the city adopted one? 
Yeah, see, that cap's in place. That's a big deal. That's good. And I, was, I needed to be careful. But it's a big chunkier. It's a, it's a big chunkier. When, values, when property values go up, the majority of your taxes in, increase over schools. That's not a, it's not a silver bullet answer, but it is a huge one. It is a huge one, and it's in place, and that's good. Okay, yes. Anybody else? Okay. Um, if anybody wants to contact me about any follow-up, I know sometimes what happens in meetings like this is, is you still have a question or comment, but you really didn't want to necessarily discuss it in front of everybody else, and so I'm always available. I know Kevin is always available. Right, and we also online on that Heritage Crossing website, we do have a place where you can post comments, questions, and they'll go directly to my mailbox, email, email mailbox, and I'll respond to those when I receive those. Um, once again, I want to stress that we have been being very diligent about keeping that Heritage Crossing page up to date with more recent items, uh, presentations to council, planning development. This actual PowerPoint will put on as well as his presentation and the question and answer session. So spread the word around if you can. Others who could make it tonight, let them know that they didn't miss out. There's still an opportunity. Uh, you can always contact me uh, at my office. Uh, my information was on the on. last slide Hold there. On. Hold on. I know it is. Um, so you can readily get a hold of us, and we definitely will make time and visit with you because we do want to continue to continue to hear your ideas. Because as Scott said, you've really opened our eyes to a lot of different things that we maybe overlooked in the past or just didn't take time to really look at in great detail. And I do appreciate you for helping us see a lot of that, Scott, as we went along. Uh, one thing before we just close tonight. Of course, I want to thank you for coming out tonight, Scott and I, and the whole city want to thank you for that. Um, in back, I have the sign-up sheet. If I've already received your email at a previous meeting, you don't need to sign it, but if I don't have your email, please sign your name, phone number, and email address so I can send you the link for the Heritage Crossing. That way you don't have to go on the city web page and try to find it. It's just a hyperlink you can open and you can find it immediately. So. No other questions. We thank you for coming out and hope you have a safe evening.